Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokos Mystery, this will be part 341 in our series. We're continuing with our lesson title, Mechanics of Salvation, this will be part 3, in which we are pursuing the biblical <coughs> understanding of the salvation process. We initially said that salvation is a process that ha happens in that part of man in which he does not <coughs> identify uh, or pursue or pay recognition to his spiritual component. When the salvation process is <coughs> brought forth, Scripture teaches the saint is to allow his new creation attributes to begin to function, to begin to function in this life, thus preparing him for life in the heavens and the life forms that dwell in the heavens. Turn to Colossians, third chapter, verse 5 to 9. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. We see that Paul links certain characteristics of the Adamic nature with the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So, basically what he's talking about deals with the things which will trap and destroy the new creation's ability to function. For which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked at some time when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. So he's talking about the corrupted characteristics that keep the saint attached to the earth. He cannot progress in the spiritual. He cannot prepare himself for life in the heavens if he's basically manifesting or engaging in these characteristics. They'll trap him here, they'll keep him here, they'll destroy him. Which mm -hmm. mm -hmm. brings us to the next principle. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the new creation is designed to function as his creator functions, not as the human race functions. So the new creation is designed <coughs> to separate the new creation from the old Adamic creature. The things that each one experience are characteristically designed to strengthen the new creation at the expense of the old creation. <clears throat> We're going to go to verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> Same chapter. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, for Christ is all and in all. What is he saying here? He's saying that the new creation functions as the creator functions. The word knowledge, <coughs> which you see here, according to the new man which is renewed in knowledge, comes from a Greek term, epikonosos, which has two meanings. One meaning is all-knowing. The other meaning is progressively knowing. So it's referring to 
the knowledge that one attains which is consistently progressing, enhancing, enlarging itself <clears throat> to the point where you reach epikinosis being all-knowing what you're all-knowing is going to continue to progress in <clears throat> its capacity right, to yeah. it, it, it never ceases, <clears throat> it never reaches a point where it reaches its completion for eternity it's going to be progressive and so we can prove that statement you've just made because we understand that the Father expands in all things and then teaches our Lord and the sons that which he had not previously given them. And he has designed the sons <clears throat> to be the recipients of what he teaches them. Mm. So everybody functions the same way. Mm. Amen. Amen indeed. So, oh, yes. And he goes on to say <clears throat> where there is neither Greek nor Jew. In other words, he's talking about the Adamic characteristic cannot operate this way. It can only operate in linear existence. It cannot operate in the way that the new creation is designed to function, designed to operate. The knowledge of the Adamic is limited, it is inconsistent, it is <clears throat> something that to a great degree is in different uh, classification than the knowledge of the new creation. The knowledge of the new creation is eternal knowledge. Nothing the new creation ever receives uh, <coughs> goes out of existence, ceases. It's continuous knowledge. As conversely, the knowledge that the Adamic mind receives is always yes. temporal. It's always uh, something that's limited and always something that's going to pass away. That explains why the uh, intelligentsia and the leadership, church leadership, believe <coughs> that they have total knowledge because they can remember every word that's you know from Genesis to Revelation. Therefore, they know all things. Ridiculous! Not, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm irritating myself just by bringing up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it, ultimately, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So the whole thing is somebody that is not fit for eternal existence mm. will be given eternal knowledge and therefore and not know what to do with it. And so they can't do the right thing with it, so it ends up being to the detriment. But what they always do <clears throat> is distort it because they don't have the ability to comprehend it because they will not leave the intellect to go into the spiritual to begin with. They're threatened by this. Matter of fact, there's a scripture that talks about they limit what they teach to the temporal physical. Mm -hmm. uh, organized religion does not teach spirituality. It teaches an earth-centered Christianity. So the verse, I can't remember where it is, uh, it's talking to the hypocrites. That, oh, oh, thou hypocrite who won't allow those going in to go in, yeah. and you won't even go in you know, yourself. You won't go in yourself. You could apply that conceptually to the gathering of progressive knowledge. Because these people believe that their knowledge ends here, and that's everything there is to know. And there can't yes. be one more iota you know, after yes. that. They believe everything is static. Mm. What you knew 500 years ago is what you exactly. know now. Today. That's why everything is repetitive, because everything is dealt with on a linear perspective not a pluralistic, eternal, spiritual perspective. They don't have the capacity to, to, to lead in that direction. Mm. <clears throat> That's why you get people that love megachurches because the stuff that they're teaching of, of, appeals to the physical, yes. the senses. Yes. Uh, you can get a blessing, blessing, and they always look at blessings in terms of a physical benefit, never a spiritual benefit. Mm. They never look at it in terms of enhancing a condition, <clears throat> your capacity to enjoy life, your capacity to love, your capacity to experience peace. They pay no price. They don't value any of that. They value what you can see, feel, taste, smell, and hear, hold in your hand, buy. And that's basically what their messages are coached in, mm -hmm. physical 
durable things that appeal to the individual. When I was first born again, I knew somebody who I'd known him previously, and I told him I was born again. And his first question was, where is all your stuff? <laughs> yeah. Because in his mind, being born again comes with a house, yes. <laughs> a new job, yeah, yeah, sure. cars. Yes. Right. And they teach, well, God wants you to have the best. Right away, everything is distorted. Well, let's go on. <coughs> Scripture teaches the new creation is experiencing a renewing process daily. 2 Corinthians 4th chapter, verse 16. For which cause <clears throat> we faint not, but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. <clears throat> this is where we get our eternal life from. <clears throat> the renewing process that's taking place within us. What it's doing is replenishing the individual, strengthening the individual, giving the individual the capacity for epikinosis for that day. To take the knowledge that you received and let it expand. That's why the scripture is consistently telling us to meditate on the word because you're always going to get more out of it than you originally received. Mm -hmm. Living in the word. It's not living in a word on a page of a book, it's living in a condition right. of spirituality. But to the carnal mind, the man that identifies only with the physical, this makes no sense. So he only sees him in terms of the physical. So that expansion of the comprehension, if you wish, is the renewing. You yes. describe that as a renewing That's of the spirit. That's the product of the renewing. The renewing is an energizing ability to pursue the things that the Spirit desires to pursue. Holy Spirit will tell you this is what you need to pursue right. for the day. The renewing process gives you the ability to do that and you are open and while you're doing it to an expansive comprehension of what you already know. Sorry. <clears throat> Where it talks about I should have given uh, your talent so I can get usury okay mm -hmm. that whole thing is you don't you're no man is an island you have to communicate with other like-minded Christians yes. the fellowshipping of the word of the knowledge and then as it as that happens they are both increased because they are both partaking of the same root that that God has given us the thing of it is is so many of us don't discuss what we learn, so we lose it. It doesn't. It doesn't make. But being renewed daily and being enhanced, and, and the other thing is being a, a functioning member of the body of Christ. When you're both functioning, the body is growing. So mm -hmm. it's a. It's a. So it was designed to function. Yeah. Nothing was designed to function in isolation. Okay. Uh, the growing saint is designed to function <coughs> with his teacher, the one that's discipling him, or the ones that are discipling him, he's to attach himself to them mm -hmm. so that he can gain comprehension of what they have to give him. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit is quickening him on the inside into a greater and greater comprehension of the realities of the spiritual existence. Yes. yes. Amen. Amen indeed. <coughs> so we understand then that the crucial aspect of this growth of comprehension, this renewing, comes about as Bray says. If somebody would learn one verse which they could pass on to another person and they did it within their first week or first month of being born again, that's called significant growth. Significant. Yes. Yes. Because you know somebody else now has benefited from that 
one verse. Immediately, your talents are set in motion. Yeah. Immediately. And you become a greater and greater a capacity to effect and a result from putting your talents in operation. <clears throat> but that's not taught. Mm -hmm. What's taught is just the opposite. <clears throat> Dependence on one individual uh, one day a week to give you something that may not even pertain to you. Sure. Where the Holy Spirit operates as an individual because the Holy Spirit is growing us in an individual manner. It takes all the ministry offices to deal with each individual <clears throat> because each individual has to have a, a, a comprehensive view yes. of what is what's happening, what's going on. You can't have one isolated view uh, in which everything else is closed off mm -hmm. because you become stunted, you won't grow, you just remain in a box. Yeah which is what happens to most Christians. They have no comprehension of what the church is designed to be. A body functioning supernaturally with the gifts operating <clears throat> severally as each individual has the ability to manifest the gifts and the calling. People spend 50 years on a seat thinking that a church is the building that he's been, he's been reading his Bible in for 50 years. Mm -hmm. No comprehension of the people that are around him and how they interconnect. Uh, you know, somebody is going to have to give an account <coughs> for the lack of <coughs> giving uh, God's program for his church. It's quite a few people have to give an account, absolutely. But let's go on. Yes. <coughs> Scripture teaches <coughs> the renewing process enables the saint to achieve greater and greater understanding of spiritual reality. I'm going to repeat that. Scripture teaches the renewing process enables the saint to achieve greater and greater understanding of spiritual reality. Turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 22 to 23. <coughs> He put off concerning the former conversation, in other words, your former lifestyle, which <coughs> you should no longer act, be accessing because it's passed away. When you became born again, all things become new. So he's saying, don't continue in the former lifestyle. It's gone. It's passed away. Put it off. That you, that you put off concerning the formal conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, begin to function as the new creation functions, shut down the Adamic functioning. And you can tell one from another by a desire of the will. If a person is continuing to pursue what he was pursuing before, has no desires for anything different, then he didn't experience the renewal, the born again. <clears throat> he has to have desires for things he didn't have desire before. And then he is to focus on those desires and begin to pursue, make them part of his life. Shut down the old pursuits, the old way of seeing things, and begin to embrace the new things because that's the spirit giving the individual it's like the newborn babe crying to have its needs met your spiritual side is making itself known so that you can begin to <coughs> uh, uh, strengthen it allow it to grow make it become you most Christians are not taught that they're taught to identify Holy as now they're a new person. 
when they're not new at all. They're just continuing what they did before, and doing the same stuff, and then wondering why it's not working. Well, do they ever actually wonder why it's not working? Yeah, because they're thinking, uh, why am I not being blessed? Why don't I feel okay, a okay. joy? Why, you know, why am I still d d dealing with the same stuff mm. the same way? I had a friend that was telling, I uh, was talking about. <clears throat> We went forward uh, at a Billy Graham crusade, and uh, <clears throat> I did that a couple of times. <clears throat> the original one was my grandmother who put her hands on the TV, accepted the Lord. Then I went to another Billy Graham crusade where I walked down the aisle and <clears throat> gave me more to make sure I was saved. Right, right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> I was talking to him about that. He was saying. I said, well, you know, why didn't you go down? And he was saying later on, well, he had talked to people before and they told him it didn't last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, well, you have to do it for yourself. They'll believe what they said. Right. It didn't work for them, but until you try it, you won't know. The idea is when you become born again, you put the litmus test out. Do you have new desires? And if you have new desires, don't kill them, don't crush them, accede to them. <clears throat> you begin to find, you're beginning to think differently about things you thought different the same way before you're thinking different now. You're having new places, things that you are pursuing. It's because you are now entered into a state of eternal comprehension as opposed to a corrupted state of temporal comprehension. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the joys of continuing to pursue that are <clears throat> beyond comprehension. <clears throat> Which brings us to the next principle. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the renewing process on the part of the saint that he has access to the heavens as a son of God. 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 1 to 4. <coughs> this is part of the new desire that the individual will begin to feel. For we know, <clears throat> Paul starts right off, <clears throat> letting us know the renewing process has been working in his mind because it's giving him knowledge that he didn't have before, that he is maturing, allowing it to become stronger and stronger and stronger. What is it that he's talking about? He says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. As you pursue the desire <coughs> of the new creation, which is created to be an inhabitant of the heavens, within you is going to be a desire to pursue that course. You're not going to be able to define it at first. It's going to be a desire that you feel that you can't put your finger on because you've never felt it before and you wouldn't feel it from an Adamic perspective. But from a new creation perspective, you're going to feel that desire. And Paul says it starts as a <clears throat> perception. The word no has two connotations. Perception and understanding. It starts as a perception. And as you allow it to become stronger and stronger and stronger, you gain an understanding of what you're perceiving. <clears throat> so he goes on to say, Ultimately you will understand that you have a building that made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be called upon with a house which is from heaven. <clears throat> if so be, <clears throat> Being clothed, we shall not be found naked. But we that are in this tabernacle do groan, 
being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What is he saying here? He's saying that the new creation <coughs> babe is going to have, like a bird, is going to have a desire to fly. It ain't going to know how to fly because its wings haven't been strong enough to give him that impetus. But the desire is there. The same thing is true with the new creation. He desires. He has a desire to inhabit a reality which is not the reality that he's currently in. And that desire is going to grow and grow and grow and grow if he allows it. But what happens, most Christians, because they're not taught, look at it as some irritant and they snuff it out. They want to, re, they want to strengthen the Adamic conscious desires. Unknowingly, they snuff it out because it is not. They have no way in which they can cultivate it. Who, who is going to give them that understanding? So what Paul is saying, what will happen if you allow it to, to, flourish, is you're going to reach a point where within you is going to come a desire. When he says uh, groan, he, the word groan there is really sigh. You're going to sigh for a reality that you know exists, but is not part of the physical strata at all. And as you allow that desire to continue to become, as you strengthen it, you nourish it, <clears throat> this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> that desire is going to like a bird's wing, reach a stage where you'll be able to use it. Turn to Philippians, the first chapter, 23 to 24. <clears throat> Philippians, first chapter, 23 to 24. <clears throat> For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart. What Paul did was he nurtured that, that desire that started off as something he couldn't comprehend, but he nurtures it. He let it go, become stronger and stronger and stronger until he reaches this point where he tells the Philippian church, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He's reached the point where he can cut it off anytime he chooses. Depart, go to the heavens, or depart, and go to be with his Lord and Savior. But he has the ability to depart. Mm -hmm. Now, go back. Uh, <coughs> are we going to go back... Uh, in a minute. But first we want to come, I'll look at another scripture. Scripture teaches, until the new birth, no man was able, ever able to have this desire. <clears throat> scripture teaches, until the new birth, no human being could ascend into the heavens. Turn to John, the third chapter, verse 12 to 13. <clears throat> If I've told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Nicodemus, who Jesus has been talking to, is it's like <laughs> he's choking on earthly things. So Jesus says, I'm not even going to tell you about heavenly things because you can't deal with the earthly things I've been telling you. And Nicodemus is a master, sits on the Sanhedrin, and he can't handle what he's hearing. But let's go on. Verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son, well, forget even, the Son of Man, 
which is in heaven. So no human has ever ascended into the heavens. I don't care what you say about Elijah, uh, Enoch, they didn't go to heaven. They couldn't. They have to be born again. Now, <clears throat> Scripture teaches the Father has designed the saint to reach the state of spiritual maturity in which he can experience the heavens before dying. Go to 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 5 again. Then Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 5. Now he that had wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So the Father has designed the new creation <coughs> to be able to grow to a point where he can experience the heavens. That's what he was created for. Why wouldn't he be able to? It's like saying that the bird was not designed to fly. He's just designed to stay in the nest all his life. No. He reached a point of maturity where he'll walk out and spread his wings. Instinct tells him he can do this. He'll spread his wings and he'll fly because that's what he's designed to do. The problem is that organized religion the tares have kept the sons of God in such bondage in a box all this time with the limitations that they've been saddled with. The, 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 the pablum that's passed for biblical principles which are basically man-centered and nothing to do with the Holy Spirit guide. Uh, this is what's been saddling saints for the past 2,000 years. Let's go on. 2 Corinthians, you have the fifth chapter. Now, we're going to close with verse 8. We are confident. What is that word, confident? comes from a Greek term. Thario means have confidence. What is he confident about? We are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, I reached the point where I don't have to worry. If I want to, I'm gone. I'm out of here. That's his confidence. Because he's allowed what's in him to grow to a point where he can write to the Philippian church and say, I would have been gone, but I know it's better for you for me to stay here. Why? Because that's what God has designed the new creation to reach. That's the function of the new creation. Earth is not anything more then the point of origin where you got born again and as soon as you got born again your focus is to be on the heavens and your life on earth immediately it says it's gone it's passed away the Colossians 3 don't think about it focus on the heavens Paul saying I don't care what the other apostles say I don't care what the other people say I know what I have reached and I'm writing to you Corinthians to let you know this is the way God has designed you to function. These other guys are so focused on the Jewish perspective and Paul is saying uh, 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 walk away from that. It's human. It's something that's going to limit you. You are not any longer limited to the Jewish perspective of things. There is neither Jew nor Gentile in the prototokist scheme. They couldn't they couldn't allow, wouldn't allow themselves to go there. Paul's the only one that writes the things that are basically 
the command structure for the new creation and the mindset for the new creation. So he goes on to say, we are confident, and I say willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. So back at this time in 1 Corinthians, <coughs> 2 Corinthians, he's saying, I reached a point where I just yielded to my desires, and they get, get me to the point where, if I choose, I can go. So we, as teachers, should we be instructing our students to pursue revelation knowledge to the point where they can feel this desire, and if they so wish, give in to it and join the Lord? No, it's to be taught from the overall perspective, because mm -hmm. each one has to develop his calling for the time and the position that the Father is waiting for him. If they were leave too early, they disqualify themselves because they weren't ready. Okay. So you wouldn't encourage it, but you let them know that this is an aspect of their development. Right. Yes. Jonesy, I'm going to repeat what you just got through saying only in my words. Now, the whole thing is, you keep taking us away from earthly concepts and principles and feeding us heavenly concepts and principles, making us better prepared to exist in the heavens. Now the whole thing is, Christianity does not tell the people, stop being so fussy about this existence, the retirement, the vacations, the, the, the American dream. Focus on the heavens, put your focus on the heavens, prepare for the heavens. And you can hear it a million times, but unless it becomes real to you, you're, you're just gonna hear it one ear and out the other not applying the principles. So, that was just... <clears throat> well, my reply to that is this. There's going to come a time when it's not going to be available. Remember, a matter of fact, turn to Luke, 21st chapter. Verse 35, people that choose the desire to sit or decide, it's not you know, worth the time. This is what's going to be the result. For as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The pursuits are going to wind up being the thing that brings billions of people, Christians, to ruin because <clears throat> the opportunity is no longer going to be there. Read the next verse, 36. Watch you therefore. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So it's going to come a time they're not going to have that Luxury. option. <laughs> all you can say all you can do is speak what they say to the Lord this is what the scripture is saying personally I prefer to have the luxuries of eternity for what's being offered I want everything that the Father has offered Amen. I don't want to shortchange myself because I want to please the Father as well Yes, by it, doing that exact thing that you're talking about, it pleases, pleases the Father yeah. immensely because He went a long way to make it available to us. Firstly, secondly, everything that you pursue in this world is limited. It's 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 going to have an end to it. Mm. Demas, Paul talked about departing. He he walked away from his calling. He walked away from ministering to Paul. He said because he loved this present world. Well, the world that he loved isn't around anymore. Sure. He sure changed himself. But everybody has a choice. You know, do do what you think is going to benefit you. I know what's going to be benefit me, and it's not what my mind tells me, it's what my heart tells Amen. me. Amen. Absolutely. I just want to remind 
everybody, I guess, because we're here as teachers, that we carry a responsibility with that title, with that name, with that position. And that responsibility is to bring the many thousands of people that we probably will never see in this physical life into a position where they can receive what we're receiving. Yes. And that's what pleases the Father. Yes, immensely. Immensely. Otherwise, <coughs> why would he have given us these positions in the first place? Exactly. exactly. I don't think many people think about things like that. If you, if you analyze objectively mm. the physical, the spiritual, and you weigh them in the balance, you find that there is no <laughs> benefit. Only things that are eternal really are going to be worth the things that are, are, are being offered. 